want to thank everyone for joining us uh, for today's webinar. Uh, my name is Tom Robbins. I'm with PlayFab. And our, to our presenter today uh, is Scott Willoughby, who is the Director of Game Operations Success. Scott has a, has a fantastic background and experience in live game operations, uh, and he's actually uh, speaking to us about we're doing two webinars. Our first webinar is on game operations fundamentals, and our second is on player communication best practices. So we really want to focus on how to look at game operations, how you should think about it, and Scott's going to give us a, a quick overview. As always, um, if you have questions, you can see within your questions panel, you can go ahead and chat them to us. We'll keep an eye on those, uh, and if it makes sense, we'll ask them during our presentation. If not, we will wait to the end. So as always, please make sure that you, you provide any feedback or questions you may have. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Scott. Scott? Thanks, Tom. Hey, everybody. This is Scott. Um, really happy to have so many people here today uh, to talk about game operations fundamentals. Um, as Tom mentioned, my background, you know, for the last 10 or so years, I've been working in digital marketing, live game management, and business management in, uh, you know, digital marketing and game operations spaces for companies like Moz, PopCap, EA, and Wizards of the Coast. I've launched and managed over a dozen games on just about every platform. I've had six editor's choices in the App Store. Um, so I've, I've been around and kind of seen the evolution of live game operations over the last few years and worked with a lot of different tools, whether they be internal or external. And, you know, the, the real thing I, I can't stress enough, and uh, in, our, in our last webinar you guys saw it, but it's a quote that we come back to a lot. The CEO of Nexon said the, the biggest difference between games that, I'm paraphrasing, the di biggest difference between games that succeed or fail these days is their live game operations and how much time, effort, and strategy they devote to those. So we're going to get into some of the, the nuts and bolts details of, of what I consider successful kind of top high-level strategies to think about when you're developing your live game operations game plan. But first, I just want to talk about what are live game operations. Uh, most of you probably have a sense of this. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page as far as how we're defining this and what kind of language we're using. So why are they important, right? You know, it used to be not long ago, you'd build the game, you'd get your, you know, your designers, your engineers would build the game, you'd make it really nice, you'd get a gold master, then you'd send it out into the world through your publisher or on Steam maybe, uh, you know, or through if you were within a studio, your, your marketing and publishing team, and that was great. Then they'd go and people would buy it, you'd profit, and things were fantastic, and work was done, and you were on to the next project. That is not the world we live anymore right? That question mark there, that's a much longer process now. Live ops is that phase two, and it's really everything from ship to sunset is your live ops challenge. So you need to think about what you're going to do after you put your game out in the world and get it in players' hands. That's really the start of your work nowadays, not the end of it. So in my mind, I kind of break live ops out into four key areas, right? Um, and any of you who've worked in digital marketing are definitely going to recognize these, right? It's acquisition, engagement, conversion, and retention. And, you know, in my mind, a lot of live ops really is a marketing challenge. It's about understanding your consumer psychology, thinking about how you can motivate players to complete the actions you want to in the game, and make your game as attractive to them so they want to spend as much time playing it and as much time living in that world you're creating as possible. And, you know, when you get really good at it and get really good at retention and creating really fantastic environments, players are thinking about your game outside of the utility of playing about it. They're thinking about when they get to come back in next. They're thinking about strategy. They're talking to your friends about it. And that's when you get a hit. That's when you get viral. So let's think about all of this all the way through, starting with acquisition. Actually, before I skip to this next slide, be sure if you have questions as we're going along, uh, type them in through the, through the GoToWebinar interface. Tom's going to be collecting them all and moderating, and then we'll go, we'll go over and try to answer as many of them as we can afterwards. Uh, we're also going to have a link so you can email questions to us if they come to you later. And we'll have this whole, this whole slide deck in the webinar posted to our website so you can review it later or share it with other people in your company. So before we actually get into those four steps I mentioned, I want to talk about KPI, key performance indicators, right? So 
the, what puts the live in live ops is really your ability to respond dynamically to the market and to your audience. And to do that, you need to understand what's going on. So these are sort of the baseline, bare minimum KPI I think any game has to know to really understand how it's functioning, whether it's succeeding or not, and be able to operate effectively and be able to make changes that are going to impact your success. So first you have to look at installs, for both organic and paid. You want to know where your users are coming from, and if you're spending money on acquisition, you certainly want to know if that's effective or not. You need to look at your user numbers, you need to understand your daily active users, your monthly active users, and your number of new versus returning users. That's a good, good indicator of how many people you're bringing in, how viral the game is becoming, and uh, if you're able to retain your users. Speaking of retention, you need to look at 1, 7, 30, and 90 day at a minimum. Your game, you will understand your player life cycle better than I can estimate. So once you start watching these things, if you're paying attention, you'll start understanding what your key retention points are and uh, where you want to optimize for that and kind of move those inflection points around. As, uh, actually, let me take a real quick second to kind of define what 1, 7, and 30 day retention are, for instance, because there can be a lot of misunderstanding here. So day one retention is the number of players who come back into your game the day after they install. So install is always day zero. Uh, well, it should always be day zero. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna proclaim that this is universal because there are some analytics programs that do day install as day one. But generally speaking, day zero is installed, day one is the day after install. Day seven retention looks at players that come back the seventh day after they've installed. Day 30, day 90, et cetera. So it's a little bit, it's a great indicator, but it's not all-encompassing because it only catches users who come back on exactly that, that day, right? So there are other things you can look at like monthly retention or weekly return rate, uh, but kind of the industry standards and ways that you can sort of benchmark are looking at that 1, 7, 30, and 90 day retention. 90 days is a good one because a lot of people see that as a benchmark for lifetime value. There aren't a ton of games that keep really deep retention beyond 90 days, but there are some, and if you're one of them, that's awesome. Then looking at conversion, you want to look at your number of paying users, both lifetime and daily, and you want to look at your first-time payers. This is, this is really important to understand what proportion of your audience is actually paying you money, um, and you want, obviously want to try to increase that. And then you're going to want to look to optimize revenue out of people who are engaging at that level. First-time payers is a big one, too, because you can see if you're continually able to motivate new people coming into the game to have a reason to spend. Then looking at the revenue that those converting users are giving you, you want to look at average revenue per user. That's uh, ARPU often is average revenue per user and DARPU, which is daily average revenue per user. Uh, that is also sometimes given as ARPDAO, average revenue per daily active user, but it's the same thing. DARPU and ARPDAO are the same thing. And then you want to look at average revenue per paying user, which is ARPUPU or DARPUPU that's sometimes pronounced. Uh, the difference between these, average revenue per user is really simple. It's just your total revenue for the day divided by your DAU, your daily active users for the day. So it's based on your revenue, how much was each player that came into your game worth on average. Revenue per paying user is total revenue for the day divided by total paying users for the day. So how much did each of those paying users contribute on average? And then you, of course, want to look at your daily revenue because that's going to let you know just in general how much money you're making and how much you can afford to spend and whether your game is successful or not and if you're going to be able to keep the lights on and start thinking about buying a Ferrari or not, right? Because that's what we all want, buy a Ferrari with your game. Okay, so now that we understand our key performance indicators that we're going to watch to know whether our game is successful, let's look at the four areas that I talked about. Starting with acquisition, which is everybody's favorite, um, and there's always a lot of focus on paid acquisition. Why? Because that's expensive, and it's, it's the hardest thing to be able to manage effectively. But I'm here to tell you, paid acquisition is not the only way to get users into your game, so I'm trying to tell you, get to know the Pope. And that's my little acronym that I made to represent paid, owned, partnership, and earned media, right? You notice paid is only one-fourth of that. Paid is easy because you can see exactly how many users are coming in. You can control it by spending more money or spending less money. If you're working with an acquisition partner, you can optimize which channels are working best for you and it becomes very predictable once you start getting good metrics on it, which is why people like it. Oddly enough, it's the easiest one to quantify. As far as you know, which ad networks you should use when you're looking at paid media, 
I'm not going to go into details here. It, you know, based on my experience, I have some favorites that I lean on, but honestly, it is different for every game. There are lots of different ad networks. Um, different ones can be more or less successful for different types of games and in different regions and languages. But I would certainly suggest working with an attribution partner. Um, there are several of them out there. The big ones are really Kachava, Tune, Adjust, and Apps Flyer. Um, I've worked with a couple of them. Uh, you know, they tend to be they they all tend to be pretty good. They're I, you know I have my favorites. But um, what these companies can do is help you identify where your installs are coming from, your install sources, both, both organic and paid. Uh, and that really helps you optimize your spend. Some of them can even look at, uh, Kochava, for instance, can look at post-install events so you can optimize for users that are engaging in multiplayer, users that are viral, users that are monetizing, et cetera, et cetera. So you can really define what a valuable user is to you and optimize your ad channels against that behavior and that, that user profile. So paid media, you know, there's so much written about it, and I could go on and on about it forever. But let's also look at some of the other areas here, all right? Owned media is your website, your social media presence, any mail lists you might have, and possibly most valuably, if you're an established studio, cross-promotion. Um, internal cross-promotion is, once you have at least one established game and a decent amount of DAU, is, in my opinion, your most valuable acquisition tool that you have. Uh, some people worry about it, that if I cross-promote users from one game over into another, is it going to cannibalize the first game and, and drive down its success? Um, in my experience, no, it doesn't. Users can hold more than one game in their head at one time. Most users are playing multiple games at a time. So it's, I, it, in many, many instances that I've seen, I see little to no impact on the source game when cross-promoting into a destination game. Um, so you always want to think about that. If you're in a position where you have more than one game and you have access to existing users, definitely make sure you're building cross-promotion functionality into the source game. There are lots of ways to do this. You can do, you know, round-trip cross-promotion where you offer some sort of currency in the source game, some sort of value in the source game for a player to go install your new game. Uh, and then you can send them back to the source at, to get their reward after they've, say, completed the tutorial or completed a meaningful amount of activity in the new game. But it's really valuable. But also, you know, don't undercut your web presence, your social presence, or, or mail lists that you already have or you might rent or buy from people. These are great ways to get in front of users and build anticipation for your game, as well as communicate with users who are already anticipating your game and are engaged with your brand. Uh, this can this can actually drive a lot of traffic and create a lot of visibility, and it's generally speaking free. Um, then partnership media. So partnership. When I say that, I'm talking about the publishing platforms or promotional partners that you can work with. This is getting featured in the App Store. This is getting featured on the Google Play Store um, or on Steam. You know, Steam has a bunch of great tools now for self-promoting. You get you get a few days of uh, and a few hundred thousand views, I think, that you can automatically choose when you want to promote your game on the dashboard. Uh, you can work with Steam. You can work with Apple, Xbox, PlayStation. Any of these publishing partners have teams to work with developers to help identify people and products that they want to showcase to their users. I know it's not always that easy. Um, I've had a lot of success with this in the past. I've, I've been fortunate enough to work with some big brands, um, but you know the the real key is getting in touch with their developer relations groups at all of these at all of these places. Now everybody asks me all the time, you know, how do you get featured in in the app store? Because it drives a ton of traffic, right? Uh, the the real key there is is getting in front of their their developer relations group, the worldwide developer relations team. Now here's here's a, an inside secret. Right now, Apple in the U.S. and anyway, out of Cupertino, there are only a very small handful of developer relations managers right now, and they're all super busy with all the apps that are going in all the time. Um, it can be difficult to get in front of them if you're not an established player already or you don't already have at least one successful game out there. Good way to do this is focus on, you know, that Apple's interested in promoting, everybody's interested in promoting good partners that help showcase their platform and their capabilities. So, you know, think about how your game is going to benefit them and how your game is going to show off the latest and greatest that they have. Uh, you can also, if you are building your game so it will play in, on Mac, uh, in the Mac App Store, 
Sometimes the Mac developer relations group can be a lot easier to get a hold of and get in front of than the App Store developer relations group. And then once you have that contact, you can you can ask for connections over to the App Store group as well. Um, you know, there, there are different strategies for all of these, and we're not going to go into them all today, but it can be very valuable. You can also look at promotional partners outside of just the publishing platforms, right? If you can uh, work with other game studios, other small startup studios, you can look at cross-promotion networks that exist some places. You can work with websites that uh, might cater to your game. You can look at forum uh, creation. You can look at, you know, doing some other partnerships to uh, promote sites or promote other products within your game in exchange for promotion of yours. There are lots of ways you can create direct partnerships with different parties to get visibility in your game, and this doesn't always have to be a monetary exchange, which would kind of edge it more into the paid category. But partnerships can be really, really valuable, and uh, again, they can they can generate a lot of interest and a lot of visibility and a lot of free installs. Then the last category here is earned media. This is things like PR strategy, event coverage, blogger and streamer coverage, and also player to player viral installs, right? So these are the things that, this is the coverage you get because your game is awesome and you're telling people about it and getting attention. Uh, this, is, this is really important nowadays, especially among your core gaming community, so especially for games that are sort of mid-core or above in terms of their, their complexity and their, their depth. Um, and this is a lot of where your kind of golden cohort comes from, those really aggressive spenders, those people who are going to come into your game day one, really excited about it and ready to spend money to get deep into it. So I wouldn't overlook this. And, you know, a lot of indies and a lot of small games, this is their bread and butter. Uh, getting visibility at events, getting PR coverage, uh, doing interviews and talking with bloggers, getting streamers to, to stream their game in, in beta and really build that anticipation, and having great viral features within your game, making it super easy for your players to tell other people about it and invite their friends to come join them, uh, especially if you have multiplayer functionality, which we'll talk about a little later, but can be really, really important. So, you know, we're not going to go into a ton of depth on any given strategy today. This is really a high-level overview of game operations fundamentals. But I really encourage you, when you're considering your acquisition and your launch strategy, don't just focus on paid and don't hope and pray for featured placement in a, in a, in a publisher platform. Be, be deliberate about it. Think about all the different areas you can promote your game, all the different ways you can promote your game, all these different channels. And if you want to work with publishers, you know, reach out to them directly as much as possible and try to engage with them actively. Uh, don't, don't just hope and pray. They've, they've got a lot in front of them, so, uh, you know, a little conversation can go a long way. All right, so once you know the Pope, uh, KPIs to watch around acquisition targets. You're going to want to watch your installs, obviously, your retention, and your first-time payers, right? You want to know which channel is, is getting you good traffic that's converting and, and helping make your game money. All right, so moving on from acquisition, let's look at engagement. So this is just, you know, give your players a reason to do more. Give them a reason to keep playing your game and, and really get into it, right? Uh, some estimates say that you have three minutes after a player first opens your game to, to hook them in and make them want to play more. So you've got to have, you know, apart from just a great game and a great gameplay loop that's a lot of fun, there are a lot of other things that you want to do. You know, you want to have social connections in there. I, you know, I know Facebook... Facebook single sign-on seems kind of ubiquitous and it might seem kind of silly. Some people believe that Facebook is sort of not as, as engaging for younger players, especially these days. But you know what? The reality is socially connected players are up to twice as engaged and spend a lot more money on, on average in, in every study that I've seen and anecdotally in all my experience. So getting that social connection is, you know, it might be a little bit of a chicken and an egg thing. Is somebody who's more likely to engage in your game and spend more, more likely to connect socially, or is a socially connected player more likely to spend more and be engaged with your game? I don't know. Kind of hard to prove, but it doesn't, it certainly doesn't seem to hurt in any example I've seen. So I really encourage social connection, and I encourage, it also obviously encourages players to connect with their friends, and they're going to be more engaged with a game where they have a human connection with other people in the game and a reason to keep coming back because they're going to be missed. Um, you want to look at events, right? This is things like individual or community quests. 
um, events that people can come into. It, it gives them an ongoing reason to keep coming back to your game. Even if they've exhausted content, even if they're kind of stuck in a spot, it gives them something to look forward to and almost an appointment mechanic to come back to. Even if this is a weekly challenge or something, they know that every week they're going to be able to come back in and they're going to have something to do that they want to accomplish that's going to give them a reward. So it's, it's really, again, motivating play and giving them a reason to come back and engage with you more. You can look at things like leaderboards can be really important and are fairly simple to integrate. You know, with PlayFab, we have a really simple leaderboard interface that's uh, it's really easy to create lots of different leaderboards for different reasons. And I, I definitely encourage this. Competitive players like to see how they stack up. Uh, but where I think there's a lot of power is if you create multiple leaderboards allowing more users to have a meaningful place on that. So having global leaderboards as well as perhaps level leaderboards or monthly or weekly leaderboards and also leaderboards among friends, clan members, etc. The more granular you can make your different leaderboards, the more meaningful they will be to more players because they have a chance to stack up against an audience that is relevant to them. Your hyper competitive top use players, they love global leaderboards because hopefully they're at the top of them and they aspire to be at the number one spot. Your less competitive but still highly engaged social players want to see how they stack up among their friends because even if they're not number one, they're excited to see who else is doing well and how they compare and how they're contributing. So look at doing multiple leaderboards and think about how you can make them relevant to your players based on the style of your game and what you want people to accomplish in it. Personalization and expression is, is really the last one. You know, this is this is a difficult one for me sometimes to help develop into games because this is not something that motivates me as a player, but it does motivate a lot of people. And you know, that in itself is, is something you really want to consider. Different types of players have different motivations for engaging with the game, and you want to try and incorporate some features to address all of them. People who like to customize games and are really about personal expression and personal identity within a game. This is a critical thing. They want to be able to make the experience theirs and express their unique personality and their unique user type within the game. So giving them a ba the ability to customize characters, customize weapons, backgrounds, etc., uh, can be really powerful. It can be a really powerful engagement driver, and it can also be a really good revenue driver. You look, one, of, one of my favorite examples is a game like Jetpack Joyride, right? It's been around for a really long time, Halfbrick Studios out of Australia. The, game, the game's been had a lot of longevity, been very successful. I think the only transaction, the only monetization mechanic in the entire game is the ability to purchase cosmetic upgrades, right? And it's done very well. So there's certainly something to be said for the power of cosmetic upgrades. I know games that I've had where there's the ability to purchase, you know, cosmetic upgrades or, or uh, you know, uh, character, character uh, upgrades. Um, it does very well and can be a very significant driver of revenue. So I encourage you to think about those elements in the game and if they make sense for your game, uh, think about how you can incorporate some of that in. So for engagement, the KPI you want to watch, DAU over MAU is one of my favorites. So this is your daily users divided by your monthly users and what this gives you, is if you take your average daily users over the course of a month divided by your monthly average users, you're going to get a ratio. The closer that ratio is to one, the more sticky your game is. It gives you an indicator of how many of your monthly users are coming back on a daily basis to play your game. Um, it's, a, it's a really good indicator and one that I think is overlooked an, an awful lot by games. But I encourage you to think about this and, and look at it in terms of how much are you bringing your users back and keeping them coming back on, on a frequent basis to play your game. You also want to look at new versus returning users, right? If uh, if this is a if this is a low ratio, it means one of two things: either you are running some incredibly successful acquisition uh, at the moment, or your game's not terribly sticky, and the bulk of your customers are people coming in on day one, and uh, you're getting a lot of install traction, but you're not getting people to come back. So you want your returning users to be a relatively high proportion of your of your users every day because those are the people that are going to stick around long enough to become engaged and convert with you. If you have only new users coming in, unless you're a premium game, which is fine, uh, you, uh, you're going to need those returning users to stick around long enough to eventually convert. Okay, looking on to conversion, right? So this is where the real money from the movie is made, so to speak, because uh, this is where people pay you. So. We want to simplify, simplify and motivate active spend activity, right? So it's not just a passive thing. So we want to look at a few things. One, your economy design. How is your game going to monetize? 
most people have a sense of this when they're making their game, but you'd be surprised how many developers I talk to that are like, well, we think we know what we want our game to be, but we haven't really thought about how we're going to make money on it. So you need to know, is, is it going to be a premium game? Are you going to charge up front for it? Do you want to do kind of a freemium model where there's a portion of the game for free and then you hit a hard paywall to, to play the rest? Uh, are you going to be ad monetized and have the whole thing free? Are you going to be free to pay, free to play rather with uh, with this kind of DLC where you get the base game is free, but then as new content comes out, you have to pay for it? Or are you going to be what I call true free to play, or um, what the wargaming CEO once described as free to win, which is there is no hard paywall. Everything in the game is actually earnable, but it requires a lot of time and effort and grinding to do so. And then you monetize by allowing people to accelerate that or to purchase things that they really want right now. Um, which can, you know, any of these can be viable models. It just depends on the type of game you're building, how you want to treat your audience, and how you're going to design your core gameplay loop. So I can't tell anybody which is best because there are incredibly successful games with all of these models. So it really depends on your goals, your game, and, and what you think is best for your business model, right? But you need to understand this and have a good idea of how you want to make money from your game and how you want to monetize it. So once you understand that, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about sort of free-to-play or free-to-win games because those tend to be the most popular monetization models these days, especially among mobile, which the vast majority of our PlayFab customers are. But it's also a model that is moving very rapidly into PC and uh, console gaming as well. It's, it's kind of the, the dominant model at the moment. So you want to think about your economy balance, right? Profile a few different types of users, your super active users, your mid-core users, and your casual users, and model their content consumption against an earn rate in the game. How quickly are they going to be able to earn enough to purchase the things that they want without spending money, right? When you launch a game, I would highly, highly encourage you, you want to start with at least 60 days of content for non-payers. People who aren't going to accelerate the experience by paying through, you want to be able to engage for at least 60 days. Um, and that may, that may be a lot of grinding and everything, but you need to make sure there's enough content to keep those people entertained long enough that they can convert at late stage if they want to. And then look at your mechanics within your games in, term of, in terms of earning power per session. How much can somebody reasonably earn within what you assume your average session length is going to be? Then build out a spend curve matching those session earnings and the price of items and figure out how you can price those items just outside of that earning curve to create some desirability and avoid runaway inflation in your game, right? You have to make sure that people aren't able to earn way more than they can ever spend or you're just never going to convert anybody for, for real money. Um, you can also do things like you know premium only items, limiting certain things behind pay gates. Now I will note, in my experience, you know this tends to be something that customers don't like and will be, especially if you have a very recognizable brand, they can be very vocal about. That said, it is definitely a legitimate model. Um, but I encourage you to, as much as you can, avoid the, uh, the pay to win uh, problem or at least perception, right? A lot of people will look at it if the best things, especially in a competitive game, a PvP game, if the best things, the best items, the best weapons, the best characters are locked behind a paywall and can't be acquired any other way than spending money, people tend to view it as pay to win. And in mid-core and above games, that you can see some serious backlash for it, right? That's not to say your game can't be successful, just be prepared for the audience outcry. You look at a game like Hearthstone, massively successful. A lot of people accuse it of being pay to win. Uh, but that does not keep them from playing and spending a lot of money with it. Activision Blizzard has been terribly successful with that game. It's a, it's a really good game. Um, but yeah, you, you want to think about how you're modeling your economy to keep it balanced to make sure it doesn't get overinflated and that you're not you know, making it miserable for users, that they're not able to get enough of the game without paying. Um, some of the other things you want to think about is where is your first pinch point going to be? When might you accidentally or intentionally pressure a non-converting user out of the game? Be sure it's not too early. You need to let somebody experience and engage with the game enough before they're hit with a paywall. Otherwise, they don't have enough understanding or motivation to continue to want to play. You need to get them to want to play your game before you ask them to pay for it in, in a free-to-play model. So really think about that and, and where that pain point comes. Um, one thing that, this is a personal preference of mine, you know, 
a lot of games monetize and a lot of them do very successfully by creating pain points, places where it becomes so difficult for the user to continue enjoying the game without spending money that they feel forced to because they want to progress and they really like the game, um, but they just get stuck. And so they spend money, but they're not happy about it. They're just doing it because they feel like they have to. Uh, I would encourage people to think about avoiding that. You know, think about how you can encourage to spend users to spend money in a way that is going to give them a better experience in the game, where they're going to be excited to spend it because they're going to get something that they really want or unlock something that they are really excited about interacting with. You know, the more you can make monetizing a good experience for both the individual player and, where possible, the entire community, there's more benefit to users and you will find people willing to spend money, especially your hyper-engaged users will spend more to help the community and help their friends enjoy the game more. It gives them a, a, an element of evangelism and advocacy for the game, which is, uh, which is really empowering to a lot of users. That's it. When you're designing your economy, when you go out the gate, I highly encourage always err on the side of making your economy too tight early on. Uh, that is, you know, make it make it harder to earn things early on and uh, make prices higher than you might eventually make them, because it's always easy to loosen things up, lower prices, increase earning rates. It's easy to do that because it's more generous to the players. That said, if you go out too loose and realize you need to tighten things, players do not react well to earning less than they were before or price increases that are noticeable. Um, so the more levers you have, the more subtly you can tune things. Uh, but I always encourage erring on the side of too tight at the beginning uh, and then loosening up as you go if, if it makes sense or if it's needed to keep players motivated and purchasing. Lastly, make sure you model the cost to complete your game, so to speak, right? Um, for different types of users too. A user who's playing super actively, you know, half hour sessions, five times a day, whatever, whatever the kind of session like this for your game and how players are engaging with it, um, how much time and money is it going to cost them to complete the game? How long will that take them? For a mid-grade user or a casual user, how long is it going to take them and how much is it going to cost them? Uh, it's, it's really important to know this because it sort of, you know, caps your upside. It dictates your upside per player that they can spend on your game in terms of time, money, and, and uh, attention. So you always want to think about that and see where your upside lands. Uh, and this is entirely up to you. I mean, I know a lot of games who model this for thousands of dollars. I know games that monetize, that target it for tens of dollars, that they want to make it super accessible for everybody to get all the way into it. It just depends on what your goals are and, and what your revenue targets are. Okay, so looking at other ways to kind of motivate the economy and motivate the spend. So we look at sales, right? These are things like cash discounts, limited offers, uh, time or event-driven items, free gift with purchase, bundles, et cetera. So generally I think about these in terms of offers that are available to everyone in the game. They're sort of global sales, right? Big sale events. Um, the biggest key to these, these are very, very powerful. And you'll, you know, once you start running sales, you will see big spikes in your revenue, and it's great. Don't get too addicted to them because you always got to consider the area under the curve after they calm down. But the key to making offers or sales really successful is surfacing them, right? If you want to really significantly lift KPI through offers and sales, you need to message them. You need to make it super visible. So we'll talk a little bit later on about, about messaging in-game and push messaging and everything else, but you need to have the capability to let your users know what's going on and what they can do, how they can make money, et cetera, or how they can save money, et cetera. I also encourage create a sense of urgency, vary them regularly, keep sales time limited, and change them up a lot. If you do the same sale over and over and over, especially on a regular basis, it's not that it won't necessarily be successful. You know, happy hours, regular happy hours are, are work really well for a lot of games. But you can start to see what we call the Macy's effect or sales hangovers, where people will reduce their spending during the week in anticipation of that sale event. So while those spikes look nice, if you average them out to the area under the curve, they may not actually be impacting your economy that much, right? By varying sales and varying the timing, you get players to engage on a more regular basis. That said, if you want to do regular events, think about how you can do things like, you know, double XP or double earn, things that are going to get people to come in and play your game more during those events and motivate them to spend more because they're going to get more value out of the result of spending, not necessarily saving when they do buy. 
Okay, so then we look at offers. Now, I look at offers as things that are, you know, they're like sales. They tend to be discounts or, or special opportunities, but they're targeted toward individual users at certain moments, right? So this can be things like impulse purchases at a pain point. You run out of life and you want to buy an extra life right now. Or, oh my gosh, I'm at the end of, I'm at the end of my round and I only have, you know, two more bubbles to pop. Can I get an extra 30 seconds? Um, I'm so stuck on this level. Can I pay to just skip this level auto win and get past it? Uh, can I preserve my progress if I'm going to lose it? This can also be uh, one-time offer starter bundles, which are super effective, or really, really deep discounts for users who haven't monetized yet and are at a key moment. You know, getting, giving a user something that is of incredible value to convince them to open their wallet that first time is a massive motivator and a great predictor of future spend. So it can be absolutely worth it to take a loss leader on a first-time virtual good purchase to get that user to convert once and get their payment information in and get comfortable with the idea of spending with your game. Again, this all comes to surfacing those offers, right? Finding the right moment where a user is going to be motivated, putting messaging in front of them to give them that offer and stressing the urgency of it. It's get it now or lose it forever. Uh, this is a very, very effective technique. So definitely think about this when you're talking about your engagement strategy and your conversion strategy for monetizing users in your game. Um, this can also be repeat purchase offers, which I've seen a lot of success with in games. Uh, this can take a couple formats. You know, maybe it's... Uh, you get a, there's a special a special item, you know, in the Bejeweled Blitz, for instance, we did this, there were rare gems that you could get randomly, and they would, you know, they were, you bought them with coins, and they would supercharge your game, uh, and then we started rare gem rushes, where after you bought one, for your next two games, if you, you'd get the opportunity to buy them again at a discount, and they got cheaper and cheaper, but you had to keep buying them. And what it did is we found that a lot of users really liked playing with these, because they, they made the game more fun, and they were really entertaining, and you get these great high scores, but maybe it wasn't your highest score ever. So people really wanted to try again using that power up. Uh, so making these things available in sequence was, was a really powerful revenue driver and a really powerful engagement driver as well. You can also do things like giving users a special discount for making another purchase within a session or making another purchase within that same week. We're trying to get users who purchased, you know, five days ago to come back and make another purchase. You know, uh, uh, you see this all the time in retail, right? You, you buy something one day and you get a coupon for 20% off your next purchase. It's going to be a really good motivator for getting people to buy consumables especially or to buy that really expensive thing that they is just out of their price range, but, well, they just got some money in their bank and now they're getting a special offer on it. It might be a good time to buy that. Okay, so then we're looking at, you know, that's, that's sales and offers and some of the different ways you can motivate spend for users, either repeat spend or first-time spend. Um, then let's look at alternate value, because not all of your users are going to convert monetarily. They're not going to spend money with you. So I always like to think about what other ways can you get value out of users beyond just them spending cash, real, real currency in your game. So one is obviously ads. You can ad monetize your game. Um, if you're going to do ads, I really encourage you to look at some of the games that do a good job of making ad viewing make sense within the context of the game. Two of my favorites are Crossy Road and uh, Adventure Capitalist, which is a, a game that, from HyperHippo that actually just, just joined PlayFab and just released a new client update uh, with PlayFab as, as their back end. Um, both of these games do a really good job of making ad viewing an enjoyable thing for users. In Adventure Capitalist, for instance, if you view an ad, you get double, uh, double your earn rate for four hours. It doesn't cost the game anything. You know, you're not, you're not limiting spend by users. Doubling your earn rate is critical to the core gameplay loop for every user. So as a player, it's, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, of course I'll watch a 15 or a 30-second ad to get four hours of double XP. In fact, I want to go back and watch six ads in a day. To keep that to keep that bonus earn rate going as as continuously as I can, so users are extremely motivated to watch ads, and they're actually excited for the opportunities to watch them because they know they're getting something of value to them, and it doesn't cost the the game, it doesn't cost the developer anything at all. Um, it's great. So I don't I don't know the numbers, but I, I'm sure they're doing very very well on their ad earnings in that game. Uh, so ads can be good, but I encourage you to make them make sense within your gameplay loop and make them a, a valuable experience for your user, not just something that you kind of pop as a, as a disruption, um, unless, of course, your model is to get people to pay to get rid of ads, uh, in which case you're creating an artificial pain point and asking them to spend money to, 
to reduce that pain. Uh, not that that can't be effective. It's just, you know, I think there, there can be uh, better ways to do that in terms of user engagement and, and making your users really love your game and, and love you as a developer. Beyond ads, uh, I like to say, you know, find ways to let monetizers pay with installs and eyeballs, right? So this can be ads, this can be affiliates or offer walls, which uh, are, are pretty common and actually can be really, really valuable. They can add, you know, 10, 15% on top of your revenue. This is areas where users can complete affiliate offers like sign up for Netflix or order flowers or um, install this other game um, and get some currency of value in your game, right? So they get an in-game reward for completing external offers. This can, this can actually be pretty lucrative for a developer, so, and it's a good way for users who just aren't willing to monetize to get the things they want in your game in an activity that's of value to you. Installs, let users invite their friends. You know, incentivizing users to integrate with social networks, incentivizing them to invite more and more friends can be really, really valuable and a great way to drive installs. I mean, they, they have friends and friend invites are more engaged with your game anyway. So. If you, can, if you can get value out of a user through them evangelizing for you, that's fantastic. And if a couple of their friends that they bring in end up becoming payers, well, you've, you've earned your value on that user and they've been a valuable part of your, your game ecosystem. So give users other ways to provide value to you and uh, you're gonna find that you have a more valuable user base as a whole and a more engaged user base. Okay, that's a lot of talk on conversion and how to get money and value out of your users. Uh, so KPI to watch on this, revenue, obviously. And, you know, bottom line, end of the day, you need to know that your game is making money and how much it's making. Um, average revenue per user, average revenue per paying user, number of paying users per day, and your first time payers. Are you continually getting people to convert? Are programs that you're putting out there like bundles and other sales and other offers to kind of drive first time conversions, are they effective? You need to know these things. So keep an eye on these KPI and, and there are some others, but these are kind of the big ones to see what conversion efforts you're, you're using that are effective for your, for your, uh, for your players. Okay, retention. <laughs> oh, Vanderbeek, you look so sad. So this is, this is a big deal, right? And there's always a lot of focus on, on acquisition and monetization, but retention's a big deal. It's way, way, way more expensive to get a replacement user than to keep a user you already have. So try, try, try hard as you can and desperately as you can to hang on to all the users you possibly can. Give them the world. Uh, keep them coming back. So. There are a few things that you want to focus on for retention mechanics, right? So content is a huge one. Live game, you have to have a content plan. As I said earlier, you want to launch with at least 60 to 90 days of consumable content and gameplay, and then you need to have a development plan for additional content over the life of the game. Um, beyond just content, you need to have an evergreen gameplay loop. You need to have something that's continually fun and doesn't just kind of lose its luster after a little while, and a gameplay loop that supports ongoing content. And then you need to be able to monitor your customer progression through your content and stay ahead of that progress to avoid losing your veteran whales, which is your, your most valuable audience. Um, one of the games that I ran, we saw that at a point where we got 15% of our active user base into the final stage of the content that we had available, we started losing revenue. So we, needed, we learned that we needed to time our content to keep ahead of that 15% backup. And once we did that, once we started releasing new content, as soon as we hit 12 or 13%, we were absolutely able to stabilize and grow our revenue. Uh, features like player versus player functionality, tournaments, quests, et cetera, can really help provide replayability and engagement between content updates to kind of keep that activity level smooth and not as spiky as you might see otherwise. Um, with communication, I, you know, I've written a lot of articles about this on the blog already, so you can go read those if you want to learn more about it, but quality, 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 right? Make your communication valuable and engaging to players. Don't spam them. Um, In-app messaging, critical for surfacing offers and content and encouraging active user behavior. Uh, push messaging, if you're a mobile game, if you're not using it, you absolutely need to. Uh, I wrote, wrote a big blog post on how to do good push messaging and why it's so important. Um, this is, it's, it's really important, guys. 25 to 50% of your DAU can be motivated back into your game with, with good push messaging. Email is often overlooked these days. 
it, but it's it's cheap and valuable. You need to have ways to re-engage users who are not coming back into your game, right? You need to be able to reach them outside of it. So push is great, but not everybody will enable it. In-app messaging is great, but if your user's not coming in, you need to be able to reach them out of that. So email is fantastic for onboarding, user invitations, re-engaging with lapsed users, transactional messaging, sale, marketing messaging, fantastic. Um, social, obviously, Facebook SSO and, and other social integrations, publishing, open graph items, and getting visibility uh, among other players is fantastic. But again, social is great because if you get engagement with your fan page or with your Twitter accounts, these are, again, ways to reach users outside of your app and get engagement outside of the ecosystem, bring them back in if, they, if they're lapsing out. Incentivize. Okay, this is, this is a big thing. With all of this, with any of your user communication, if you want somebody to do something, bribe them. Bribery works in this case. Give away currency, give away items, give huge discounts. Do what you have to do to motivate the player action that you want to motivate, right? And uh, it seems super simple, but it, it really does work. I've seen this time and time again. So as you get more desperate to keep a player, as they've lapsed out longer and longer out of your game, but their play frequency drops and drops and drops, get more generous. Like, do what you got to do to keep them. Again, how much virtual currency or in-game items is it worth to keep a user who's been in your game versus the cost of acquiring a new user that you know is going to stick around as long as the one that you might lose, right? You need to balance it out, but I, I say be generous. And then finally, transitioning. I mean, you know, sometimes a player has just engaged with your game as much as they're going to engage, and no matter what you offer them, they are just not interested in playing anymore. So at this point, the most valuable thing you can do is keep them within your studio ecosystem. Try to cross-promote them to another game. Try to find them another gaming experience that's of value to you that you can get them that you can get them into. If you're a studio with multiple games, this is moving them into another game. You know, keep them in your shopping mall. You might not care which store they're in, but you want them in your shopping mall. If you don't have that availability, you can work with ad networks to cross promote into other games and, and get some get some good value out of that. You know, get some incremental value out of what you've spent to acquire that user. So these are all things you can do, and for retention, the KPI you want are obviously retention. This is a retention matrix, your, you know, your 1, 7, 30, 90-day retention. Your monthly active users is a really good one to watch. That should be, very, that should be a stable metric. If that's declining, um, you need to think about your retention strategy. And then again, your new versus returning users. You need to know how sticky your game is and what proportion of your, of your uh, population is, is new users uh, that you're able to keep around. So, I know that last one was a little rushed, but uh, Tom gave me the, the note that we're kind of moving along in time here, and we want to make sure there's a little bit of time for questions. So uh, Tom's been taking your questions on, on uh, the chat here, and we'll go through a few of these absolutely. that we have time for. No, absolutely. Thank you, Scott. Um, we got a, we got a few questions. Definitely, for those of you uh, listening, please go ahead and uh, input some more questions. Um, Scott, one of the big questions people are asking is this idea of retention. Um, what would you say are some standard goals or expectations of retention um, people are asking in terms of time and maybe percent of installs, as well as kind of the calculations? Do you think about it as something that's a rolling metric? Um, could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, you know, sort of there are some sort of industry standards that you look at for retention, and they, they tend to be along the lines of 40-20-10 um, for one seven and 30-day retention. Uh, that is 10, 40% come back on day one, 20% come back on day seven, and 10% will come back on day 30. Uh, and that, that's for a fairly successful game, right? Oh, sorry. There we go. Um, so, you know, those are kind of industry standards. This is going to vary with every game. And, and the, real, the real thing to keep in mind and pay attention to is not necessarily how you compare to those numbers out the gate, but actively trying to optimize and improve them over time uh, with your communication strategy, with your, you know, even your conversion strategy can impact this. If you make your game too tight for users and too difficult to experience enough before they're forced to monetize, it can hurt your retention. And if you watch your retention curve, and, and we've got, you know, we've got good retention metrics in PlayFab, if you watch that graph, you can identify drop-off points. You can identify inflection points. 
And when you see those, it's important to think about, okay, how are users consuming your game and what sort of activities and what sort of pain points are they running into that are impacting that retention, right? So, you know, that, that 40-20-10 is, uh, you, you'll also see 30-20-10 sometimes. It depends on which studies you look at. But um, those are kind of standard benchmark numbers you can look at. And if you're, you're hitting those, you're doing pretty well. Um, but, you know, always you want to try and exceed them. Uh, so the, the biggest thing is really to watch your metrics, watch how your users are behaving, and try to improve and optimize all the time rather than just hoping and praying that it's, it's working the way you want it to. And then uh, I guess the other question uh, is how do you calculate it? So do you think of it as a rolling number? Yeah, you, you need to look at retention by cohort, right? So for each day, each cohort of new installs on a given day, so for, for instance, today being the 30th, this would be day zero. So we'll look at all of our installs that came in today, and over the next 90 days, we'll watch all of those players from today. So we'll look tomorrow and see their day one retention, how many of them come back tomorrow. We'll look in a week and see how many came back on day seven. We'll look at day 30, day 90. And then what you do is you go back and you average that out over, usually over the month, you want to look back at all of your cohorts that have been in the game for 30 days, you know, how many came back on day 30. You look over time and see how many players came back on day one. So what this means is that for your deeper retention metrics, your 30, 60, 90, 180, 360 day retention metrics, the game needs to have been active long enough that you get cohorts that fit into those, right? You won't get your first 30 day retention metric until your game has been live and you've had users in for 30 days. Um, so it is always kind of rolling and you get a more meaningful average the longer, the, the more days past that, that cutoff you've had to get more user cohort, cohorts filling that out. Perfect. And then uh, one more question that came in is, can you talk a little bit around uh, the attribution partners? You talked a little bit around attribution and uh, maybe kind of just a, a quick overview of why it's so important. And then I think you had mentioned a couple of partners that people were interested in. Yeah, absolutely. So um, mobile attribution tracking is, uh, I think actually that name is, is trademarked by Tune for their system, but um, it's, it's really important for mobile acquisition. If you're at because, so on the web, on, on web marketing, you can buy banners, you can buy ads, you can buy Google AdWords, you can buy these and when a user clicks on them, they go to your web page or they go to a destination and you're able to track that through a referral URL. On mobile, the user isn't going into a referral URL, they're going into the store, the app store, the Google Play store most likely, to install your app. And you can't track that because they don't have the app in for you to send them right into it and see where they came from. So what mobile attribution companies do is they look at a user who clicks on an ad and they assemble a fingerprint for their device. You know, and it uses like device ID and IP and location and a few other things to create a pretty, pretty good fingerprint of that device so it's recognizable. And then when a new user comes into your app, when a new user installs your app, they look at that user and kind of do a little bit of forensic science to match up and see, oh, is this device, does it have the same fingerprint as somebody who clicked on an ad? And if so, they match it up and attribute that install to that ad. Now, this is really, really important because obviously what you're trying to optimize for is a cost per install for whatever type of user you value. Across the board blanket, you know, you can just do cost per install, cost per any install. Um, that's not necessarily the best metric uh, because you can do incentivized installs through a company like Tapjoy. It'll be very cheap and you can get, you know, 100,000 installs in the Philippines that were incentivized to do it, but they'll probably churn out and uninstall your game very, very quickly. So just as a side note, raw CPI cost per install is not always the best metric. So one of the other good things that these attribution companies do is they will look at post-install events. So after a user installs and they identify that fingerprint and match them up, you can then set them up to track events after a user has installed your game. That might be first play session, tutorial completion, uh, has engaged in X number of multiplayer matches, has spent money is a, is a big one. Uh, and by looking at these things, you can then identify what, you can, you can define what you think a valuable user is, whether it's somebody who's spent X days in your game, has spent X money in your game, has accomplished Y in your game, and then you can look and figure out which ad networks, which ad campaigns, in fact, 
are getting you those most valuable users at the best price. This allows you to then optimize and cut out campaigns, cut out spending that is not effectively getting you the users you want, and devote more of your money to the channels that are working best for you. Um, this is really, really important. If you're going to spend a significant amount of money doing paid acquisition for your game, if it's a mobile game, uh, you know, I, I think this is a must-have. You need to know how you're spending your money effectively and where your installs are, are coming from and what's working best for you. Uh, some of the companies that do this, the, the big four sort of, are um, Kuchava, whom I've worked with a bunch in the past. They're, they're really good. Tune is another one. Tune's mobile app tracking. They're right down the street here in Seattle. Um, Adjust and Apps Flyer are the other two uh, that are pretty big. A lot of people use them. I, I don't have any personal experience with either of those, but, um, you know, they're very popular. Uh, Kuchava is the only one I've worked with that I know does really, really robust post install. Uh, attribution um, for post-install event attribution. Uh, the the others very well may do that, but I don't have experience with that. Um, and the different, you, you also want to look at which ad networks you want to participate in because the different providers, uh, the different attribution providers have different ad networks integrated. Uh, some have a few hundred, some have a few thousand. So you want to make sure that the ad networks that you want to spend on are included in their SDK so you can track those installs. Excellent. Well, we're about out of time. I would definitely want to thank Scott for, for giving us such fantastic information. Pleasure. For those of you that are still here, we will make the recording available uh, on our YouTube channel. As always, we are continuing to, to grow out our list, of, uh, our, our list of webinars that we're going to be making available, and we're going to have a whole bunch of them, and we are definitely looking for titles that you think might be interesting uh, or topics whether you're interested in having us present or maybe you know someone who might want to present. Um, if you have any of those questions uh, or thoughts, please don't hesitate to let us know at webinars at playfab.com. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, end today's webinar. And thanks, Scott, for doing such a great job. Thank you. Thanks, thank everybody. Uh, thank you. Bye-bye.